high school with his son, Leighton Taylor, and who went then into the Air Force in World War II, and he did survive, but I, I haven't seen or heard of him for many years. But uh, uh, I was very familiar with all of the activities that you talked about uh, that occurred because uh, I went with Harvester in 47, so I stayed in the refrigeration industry. And uh, then I went with Whirlpool when they bought Harvester, and that's when they also bought the Savelle properties that they did. And they did buy the refrigerator part of it. And they tried for two or three years to uh, reduce the cost of the gas refrigerator to make it competitive with electric. And the engineers worked very hard on it, and they were able to cost reduce it considerably with no sacrifice in quality. The only problem is that most of those uh, cost reductions were applicable to the electric refrigerator also, so they didn't, didn't gain any ground. And uh, Harry Shagaloff was the engineer who invented that Cervelle ice maker mm -hmm. with the semi-circular shape. Yep. And uh, he did not go with Whirlpool, but uh, a guy named Bill Lindstromberg worked with him on it, and Bill did go with Whirlpool, and uh, he passed away not too many years ago. So that's all a bunch of, would you believe history, except, hell, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating. I'm so happy to hear that, and uh, it uh, certainly uh, adds a lot to uh, what I'm able to bring since I was only two years old. And, <laughs> However, those uh, semicircular cubes still exist, and I get them out of a Whirlpool refrigerator every night, pour a little bourbon on them. <laughs> in memory of my grandfather, he broke, broke, uh, uh, drank his share of bourbon in the obituary. Ed Klingler wrote about him. He said that uh, Louis Riefenberg could drink bourbon steadily all night and get nothing but a pleasant buzz on him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have one other person that's wanted to say something that stood up when they worked at Cervell. or somebody else I saw, okay, uh, is Willie. Uh, one other statement on, on Cervell, I've got to be away from this microphone, but Cervell made two million refrigerators as in 1941. That was the two millionth. In 1940, the United States population was about 135,000. And in 1940, we had about 35,000 homes and 50, 117,000 homes. So it's about 5% of every home in 1940 had, a, had one of your refrigerators. So that's a pretty big statistic. But they said they had monopoly for about 20 years right. until the electric came out. And I'm going to get some of these made up and start making refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> this is Willie, and he did work at Savell too. Hi, Say Willie. Okay, I'm Bob Williams. I graduated from Central High School and got a job at Savell in 1952. And I was a leak tester, testing all the wells that went into the refrigerator. Didn't do nothing real great. I <laughs> Went into the Army in 53 when I got drafted. Oh, yeah. okay. My team will bring the uh, microphone to anybody else that might have questions about Cervell or the wings that made that, that were made by Cervell here. Any other questions at all? Uh, okay, we have a question here. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, say your name. Uh, say your name. I'm Kohler. I uh, worked at Boots Manufacturing, and up in the attic, they had some of the old tanks that Cervell used in their refrigerators. They were galvanized, and they had a little cart float in them, and that was, they were, they didn't, wasn't making them then, because I didn't start there until the 60s, but they had made them, and they had some of them up in the attic yet, it's left over, and uh, they made, apparently they made those for Cervell at one time. Mm -hmm. Any other, here's another question. Uh, okay. uh, when, when we were children, we had a Cervell refrigerator. My dad worked there. 
And, uh, but we still called it, we wanted to call it an ice box. And mm -hmm. Daddy says, no, this is a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, and my grandparents had the same, and they'd always say, there's one moving part to that refrigerator. Is that right, Pete? Right, that was the amazing thing. You use gas heat to make something cold, and there weren't any uh, moving parts, so to speak. My name is Jennifer Green. Uh, my understanding was Cervell was one of the first to make the refrigerators. Is, is that true, or? Well, uh, it, she might imagine with the turn of the century in the early 1900s, uh, we're still chopping ice in frozen ponds, and uh, there's a heck of a big business delivering ice around uh, in a well-insulated box. Those would last, I guess, into the summer. Uh, but uh, the Cervell, I guess, would be one of the early refrigerator makers, and the key is the uh, Wintergren uh, patents from Sweden uh, that they brought in. That was the process that we're talking about. And uh, since we're wasting your time, and it looks like most of you have time to waste, uh, I'll add one other thing. Uh, Wedegren was very interested in anthropology and uh, the early man coming out of Af East Africa in the Great African Rift. Uh, and he had a foundation that he set up, the Wedegren Foundation for Anthropological Research. Uh, and my grandfather was on the board of that for years and years, probably almost till his death in 1969. But I remember we always had these green-bound academic studies. Uh, the Leakey family, L-E-A-K-E-Y, I think it was, were uh, 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 working down there in Africa and discovering uh, early man. And uh, Mary and I actually got to take a trip to Africa, and we went to a place where the Leakeys had, uh, had been. But then to wind up this rambling story, this marriage giving me a sign like that. <laughs> Later in life, our, our uh, youngest child, Meg, was going to Michigan and graduate school in anthropology. And she needed financing for a trip to Ecuador to do research for a thesis. And lo and behold, she got a grant, not through my grandfather, me, or anybody, but on her own merits from the foundation that Wintergreen set up. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, your uh, salary just dropped down because you said we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, we were going to give you a big high payment, but you I, said we didn't have anything to do. No, now, I'm, Pete, we're, I'm talking uh, about uh, some of us who are lucky enough to be wealthy retirees. <laughs> Other questions out here? Other questions? Yes, we have a question up front here. We've got to get a microphone. You've got to say your name and um, say your name and everything. My name is Hazel T. Poole, and I was just wondering, are you working from something that your grandfather made? I mean, is, is that how you got a job? I mean, you know what I mean? A, it's a handy down. I mean, I know you worked hard, you went to college and all that stuff, but did this happen? No. Uh, <laughs> not, to be, not to be bitter and a smart aleck, but uh, I guess I, uh, my grandfather was an executive with a company, Cervell. He worked mainly for salary. Didn't own the company, didn't own much of it at all. My dad was at Kent Plastics and Ball Plastics for his career. He made a good salary, didn't own any of the company. And I had worked at several places, including Red Spot Paints. I didn't own any of the company, got a good salary. So the fact that Mary has decent clothing on today is all me, <laughs> I wouldn't have handed down. <laughs> This is Mr. Jerry Schreiber. Here's a question. He's Navy. I don't have a question. I see all the names. Ruthenberg, Boots. All the names. 
I was canning for her when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I grew up as a cat, and now I can play. I used to feel play. <laughs> anyway, I love my name with those fellows. Thank you. Thank you. She was talking about hand-me-downs, Wayne Barry. Uh, the lady was talking about hand-me-downs. We'll go back to the early 40s. My dad was helped bring cryogenic gases into Sodal in the nitrogen and oxygen in the production of the refrigerators. He worked in that line from 30 to 50 at Sodal. In 51, he went to Holland with cryogenic gases. 67, I stepped in his footprints and I hauled it for almost 20 years. So we've been connected. And I can remember as a little boy, a lot of you people will probably remember the railroad tracks from Surveil down to Trotman's. When Dad get off work in the afternoon, four or five of us kids would run up the railroad tracks to Surveil and walk home with Dad. And I can remember that like it was yesterday. Uh -huh. And then the pictures my family had of the Surville Christmas picnic, Christmas parties at the Coliseum. Some really great memories from a great time. Thank oh, you. that's great. My name is Mary Barron. I'm not so sure I'll get my last name after you. <laughs> but I, we also had a Victor Garden. But we didn't take our veggies to Surville. We sold them in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And it was a wonderful experience. And in fact, they, Wayne was talking about going up and down the railroad tracks. Dad didn't even eat there. He carried his lunch pail. And he had that lunch pail for, I don't know how long, a long time. But Servelle was good to me. It was a good company. We've heard so much about Mary. Would you please introduce us to Mary? <laughs> Mary, stand up, Mary. Okay, I'd like to introduce Mary Rogers, Ruth and Burke. Uh, her parents, Maynard and Martha Rogers, came to Evansville in the late 30s. Her dad was an independent petroleum geologist, and uh, she lived down on First Street. Uh, we didn't live in the same street or the same neighborhood, but we went to the same swimming pool. And when she was 16 and I was uh, 15 and a half, I noticed her climbing out of the diving pool, and I was struck by the look of intelligence in her eyes. <laughs> that was 1959. We've been inseparable ever since. <laughs> Sometimes we fight and she gets in her car and runs away for about six hours. <laughs> Pete, uh, Pete, Pete I, I know you don't make very many mistakes, but you did state that she's older than you. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, no, she uses that to uh, point out my mistake. She says I'm older and more mature than you are. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Just if you want to hear quickly. Okay. Say your name. Jeanette Bittner Phillips. My father was a foreman on the wing plant, and he was known as Whitey Bittner. And I remember as a small child, we would go to a picnic ground, the Servelle Picnic Ground. Servelle Gun Club and Picnic Ground. Where, was, where is that at? And I, I don't remember now, when but the, uh, there was uh, some really good times had there. Yeah, it was... Uh, south of town. Remember when that horrible tornado came through and a lot of people were killed in mobile homes? I think it was just across the street and east of there in Kenya. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Servelle had uh, all kind of uh, activities for employees, uh, different teams. Some of them were semi-professional baseball and that sort of thing. All kind of clubs and stuff. It was, uh, it was pretty interesting. There's a fire department there now that uh, I think's bellied up right there by Angel yeah. Mounds yeah. is where the. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm Russ Wink, and uh, I have a recreational vehicle, and I still have a gas and from the refrigerator in my vehicle, so they still work quite well. <laughs> Got past the long Cervell uh, technology uh, from our clue to somebody that is out. Bendix. Is that right? No, I'm thinking farther along, but it doesn't really matter. I heard the name was Dometic, maybe? Uh, Dometic was in that mix, and there was one other one, but uh, not a good. Well, uh, the other part, I appreciate all that you shared about the background of how the world got ready for World War II. Uh, from a survival standpoint, uh, amazing how they grew so fast and so big uh, fiscally, as I uh, should say physically, physically. Uh, how did they manage, you may not have the answer to this, how did they manage to gear up so fast for making refrigerators to now building wings. Well, I don't have the answer to that uh, other than I would make the observation that there was a strong engineering culture at Cervell, a lot of great engineers and a lot of other innovative folks. And I worry now because we've offshored most of our manufacturing and could we even do what we did then? Now the next war isn't going to be fought the same way, but uh, could we even do some of those things? But uh, this uh, technology of how do you draw metal and make steel bullets, which they never made before because you couldn't get brass, some of these other things. Cervell had core competencies in metal bending and painting and this and that, uh, but uh, uh, could we even do that anymore? Other questions? Other questions? Okay. Um, I would like to thank Pete and his family for uh, helping out today, and uh, we have to uh, give a pause. Oh, we got another question back there. I don't have a question. I have comments. Uh, I, I don't even need that. God bless me with a loud voice. <laughs> I want to say this very, very nice, Pete, that what you put on today and everybody involved in it. It's been very enjoyable. I am a son of a mother, Rosie the Riveter, no airplane wings. Loved your grandpa, highly respected him. My father also later after the war worked for your Cervell. Uh, history is going in this country so much we see it every day. I love this. I want to support this. Uh, I don't understand why things are going the way they are, but we all see it, it hurts us. I know it does, but we wouldn't be here because we care about our country, we care about our history. And I want to salute you all that was part of that. My father was in the South Pacific, he went all the way through to Tokyo, Japan. I had an uncle that was in Pearl Harbor when they bombed it, and, and went on and lived to be 96 years old. My mother lived to be 87, my dad lived to be 88. That's the toughest generation there ever was. And they're always a part of me, what you talk in life. But it just hurts me to see where we're heading and just keep that voice going. Tell the people about this place. Get them in here to see what really took place and all about sacrifice. What those people had to sacrifice to give freedom to what we have today. And I just want to comment on that. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And you've done a great job. And all of you involved again, thank you so much. Well, and thank you for that uh, sentiment. I would add, if you haven't joined the Evansville Wartime Museum and paid dues at some level, please do so. Thanks, Mark. You got anything else? Okay. Then I, I'd like to just uh, tell you one other thing. Uh, the uh, everybody's heard of the Smithsonian. 
Well, Smithsonian's going to be here next Tuesday to photograph that plane and do a little movie on this plane. So uh, they're doing the Warbirds, and uh, we were selected for them to take Hoosier Spirit to. So it's helping our community, and when they put their documented uh, movie out, uh, I call you to watch it, and it'll be that baby right there, uh, Hoosier Spirit 2. So uh, we're lucky that the Smithsonian's uh, being part of our museum. Thank you, uh, P. We will see you next month, January 6th. Sign up somewhere and go. Uh, Mr. Bell will teach you how to fly, and he's on salary, so make sure you earn his key. Thank you.